the themes in the art of the revolution. Um, first, I wanted to lay a little bit of a historical background out because obviously it's really significant in what we're seeing in terms of art history. Um, we're looking mainly, when we're talking revolution, at the French Revolution. So French Revolution, leading up to this, we have the uh, Enlightenment, which is a really significant shift in thinking that is spreading throughout society. We have different thinkers like Locke um, giving, you know, support and speaking to the importance of rights of the people, including the right to revolution. Um, and we also have Voltaire, who is speaking out against the nobility um, and the uh, despotic rule of kings and different privileges of the church. So a lot of this is really laying groundwork for a, a huge shift in the way that society is viewing their current systems. Um, so that current system being the Ancien Regime. Um, I apologize if my French pronunciations are not great, but we're working on it. So uh, in the Ancien Regime, we have the different estates, and obviously they were having a lot of political troubles for various reasons, but um, it results ultimately in the fall of the Ancien Regime and the rise of the Reign of Terror. So Reign of Terror marked by the guillotine and the lo uh, a lot of public executions, notably including King Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Marie Antoinette. Um, so Reign of Terror, there's just a huge amount of political discord, disruption, there's a lot of violence and just upheaval. So I think it was about 16,000 people who were beheaded by the guillotine and a lot of these for, well, most of them for political reasons of, you know, suspected parties and whatnot. Um, so a lot of that, the Reign of Terror is depicted in art history of the time or at least influencing the themes that are chosen in depicting um, at the time of European art. Um, and then ending in the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, um, that I think we get into more with the next area of themes, but I do find it really interesting how Jacques-Louis David is woven all throughout this historical context and ending in the painting of the coronation of Napoleon Bonaparte is such an interesting uh, place for the lecture to, to take us as he, um, you know, was outspoken and depict his chosen scenes um, for the revolution and then is, you know, the state-appointed painter once more. Um, so, yeah, enlightenment and this, you know, real political upheaval play a large part in what is chosen and on view in the salons um, at this time. So some of the themes that I've identified of revolutionary art are as follows. Uh, the influence of the academy. So there's the structured schools, there's different levels and tiering of how art is appreciated. And um, a main one of those that comes, you know, top tier choice is historical painting, which we view a lot of in the lectures from this week, um, showing different scenes. So historical painting originally from the antiquity as we get from here uh, and then ending in contemporary historical paintings as a use of like a you know both the ancient historical paintings and contemporary both as um, an allegory of sorts um, so another really large influence i'm obviously is the grand tour so the neoclassicism in the name itself, we have a new classic style. So we're reverting back to an appreciation and a recreation of, of a lot of things that were born in antiquity. This grand tour was really um, a, a really interesting, I, I guess I never understood the enormity of this pilgrimage of sorts. Like It's like a cultural pilgrimage. Anyone who's anyone or wants to be anyone, uh, will go on this grand tour and view Italy and works, Italian works um, from the Roman Empire, and then it expands to Greece um, to view, 
what they believe is really the um, models of an enlightened society. So these, um, the way that statues are formed is becomes like a really, really highly regarded um, format for drawing. And that is what is influencing the curriculum of the academies. And also the stories, the myth, the the mythic tales from antiquity that appears in a lot of the different paintings of this revolutionary art. Um, sometimes in, you know, for the reason to draw connection to current events. Um, if not that, then to serve as exempla virtuitis. So this exempla virtuitis to not just use art to depict silly, you know, people frolicking um, and living in their lavish lives, as we maybe saw with Rococo a little bit, um, but really to give a strong moral message that is behind the artwork. It is an intentionally chosen scene because there is something to be gained from this um, artwork that the viewer is, you know, able to behold and hopefully walk away pondering. Um, and all of that in alignment really with the, not just like the ideals of the Enlightenment, but the process and the way that the Enlightenment thinkers are proposing that we live as a society to to take things in and um yeah not just for fun but really elevate it so the example of gratuitous uh all of these things are really mixing together and then like i had already said use of contemporary historical paintings as subjects um these become political propaganda we saw a few different examples of martyrs who were painted um, in or drawn in a few different ways and I think that using either a like um, a scene that tells us uh, moral um, or showing the contemporary scene both of those really I mean primarily their main aim is to serve as political propaganda in one way or another let's be honest um, okay so just to review a couple works that I think make a strong connection to the one I've chosen um both are by jacques louis david his probably most notable works um the oath of harati i don't know if that's said right but we're going with it um and the death of marat so um death or the oath of harati is like i had mentioned before that is more of the historical painting that comes from a tale of antiquity of these brothers who are fighting to defend rome um we have the women who are just in anguish in the corner knowing this isn't going to end well no no matter what because of their ties to the side that their brothers have to fight um in yeah it, for Elba um I really think this is a amazing piece in the way that it's laid out visually I love the simplification of the background with just really um, that neoclassic architectural style um, simplistic it's darker in tone like in coloring and so that's really putting the emphasis on the forefront so this is almost like a scene of a stage um, you know like if you were to see a play and really really the emphasis is on the story on this captured moment um, that is actually something I feel like I should add to the list of these themes um, of revolutionary art is the choice to depict a suspended moment of action either just before um, not I guess not usually just during but either just before or just after something has happened that's significant and is you know the narrative that's being shown um, in this case we have before the action with Oath of Harati and then after the action with Death of Marat um, I loved that phrase, the pregnant moment. So both of these, and I think many, many um, artworks from the revolutionary art world are um, fit that theme of capturing a pregnant moment. So yeah, this composition I, yeah, I love so much, um, but really the stiffness and just kind of like the phallic <laughs> uh, nature, as was pointed out, of these males as they're taking this oath um, to the swords being held by their father, the women who are just have such a different posture and emotion um, in their um, 
facial expressions uh, in the corner, that really is kind of more in line with the emotion captured by the, well, I guess, corpse of Marat. So um, this one is, I mean, visually it's interesting because I really, really like the, the tenebris on the super dark background that is used to really highlight and almost gives Marat this angelic like essence with the use of light bathing his body as he is gone. Um, and this scene is, is amazing because it's really showing that pregnant moment by giving you clues so to what, to what has just happened. Um, this, um, this Marat is known as a martyr. Uh, he's pretty, you know, radical revolutionary. And he is, if you're familiar with the scene at all, you can look at these different visual clues that he has just been murdered, um, with the knife underneath him, the letter that he had been working on that has little blood stains. You could see the blood in the bathtub of this like medicinal bath. So really, um, the use of these elements to subtly tell the story to the viewer is, to me, amazing and something we see in a few different uh, revolutionary artworks um, as they try to capture that exemplar virtuitous and really pick a scene to tell a moral, um, a moral of the story that you should take away as the viewer. Um, so the work that I've chosen to focus on is a little bit outside of um, the realm of France in the sense that it was painted in France, um, but it is of a British like story. So the scene is the execution of Lady Jane Grey. That is the name of the artwork by Paul de la Roche. Um, it comes a little bit later in the timeline as well. So 1833 um, and it was exhibited in the Paris Salon. So I think this has so many, so or fits the themes in so many ways because again we have that exemplar virtuitous. We have something to walk away with that is telling a you know something of significance that we should we should learn from from viewing this painting. Um, so in this case, it's the execution of this woman, this girl who was seventeen and she had reigned for nine days. Um, in the British court, I think it's like Tudor England, and her cousin had like arranged for her execution. Um, just like we had seen in the last two images, you have these bodies in the corner who are unable to look at the violence that is coming. Um, it's a really simplified background. It's a really dark image, but if you have a little bit more lighting, you could see again, similar to the Oath of Ferrati is like a simplified neoclassic architectural background. So really, really, you're just focused on this uh, s almost like a stage scene of what is happening. And again, we are in that pregnant moment of instead of after with Marat, right before, right before her execution. And just like with Marat, we have visual cues to tell that story. So we have the block, the wooden block where the beheading will take place um, attached to the floor for ensuring that. Um, we have the axe that will do that unfortunate task. I, I find it really almost unsettling the way this figure is depicted with a lot of apathy for what's happening, but um, that's just my take. Um, Again, clues to what's about to happen is the straw that's laid on the ground, which is there to catch the blood and her fallen head. Um, very gory and ooh, unsettling, but it really does tell what's you know what's happening here to someone who maybe that didn't have context and happened upon this image or this painting. Um, one thing that I really really love about this painting is this dress that she's wearing. Lady Jane Grey is uh, in this beautiful white dress, really, really highlighting and kind of giving a visual clue to her innocence. So again, they're painting her with this innocent, um, like she, she's a martyr of what's happening to her, of martyr of this political turmoil that they are experiencing as well 
um, as was Marat. And she is now in the scene falling victim to whatever political turmoil is leading to her violence. So that's really that that main takeaway here. And it also fits the theme, obviously. It's a historical narrative, but this of a contemporary his, history, um, historical moment. Um, not of 1833. I think it was the seven, 1700s. I didn't write down the date. But 1700s when this uh, Lady Gr- Jane Grey was executed. So um, I think the choice of depicting this scene was really interesting and important. And... Um, I think it, it is really in line with showing other revolutionary artworks of of just really what is part of this revolutionary experience. These innocent people who become martyrs, who are dying for good, question mark, bad, you know, what well, the reason why we're, we're a little bit unsure, but really it gives you a lot to think about in terms of whose side are you on where do you stand as the viewer taking in this image which i find to be really powerful and that level of capturing all of these individual expressions is really uh, remarkable um okay so in conclusion i wanted to just point out this excerpt from on decadence of the academy so this is uh jacques louis david in his critique of the salons so really to circle back to all the themes um let me just read this quote which is all from the same page Uh, like a swarm of maggots crawling from a rotting cheese a countless mob of artists crawl from the academies in these academies or schools of art and beauty reigns a despotism which only i'm sorry despotism which only permits uh, what can be seen every day to enter the students brains mindless drawing after plaster cast and models go on for years the goal is not truth to nature, but an abstract aestheticism or aesthetic mannerism, which kills all character. A thousand figures drawn in this manner look as if they all had been formed in the same mold. Such empty brushwork is aptly named academic. Their details look natural, but the whole remains artificial because it's not animated in the spirit of art. So I really liked this quote because one, it's, I mean, it's just obviously pointing out uh, the academies have a large hold on what's happening in art world at this time but really he's critiquing academies in favor of creating scenes like this um like these where you know obviously there's beautiful depiction of the human bodies and detailing of their musculature as learned in the academies and drawing of these sculptural figures that they had done from antiquity um but for Jacques Louis David, it's not about just um, drawing a thousand figures in a manner that had been formed perfectly. For him, it is the storytelling. It is that exemplar virtuitous. How are we using these skills from the academies, the schools of art, where we can learn the technicality, we can recreate the image, we can, you know, do the skills to churn out the work. But what is that function of that work? What is it doing? What is the story it's telling? Where uh, in the Enlightenment and revolutionary ideals is it fitting into and um, elevating? And I just thought that was, well, at least that was my interpretation of, of what he's getting at here. And I really, I think it captures a lot of, of these themes. So, yeah, just to review, the, um, the Academy is a huge part of laying the visual choices that are made um, in terms of at least the human depictions, especially human depiction. Um, I think this pushback is going to be really interesting, and it's something that I personally would like to delve more into because um, uh, I think it, especially in the lecture when he's talking about David is talking about displaying his artwork for the public and why that was important to him and what that creates. I think that is an interesting door opening to content, more contemporary art and the way that we interact with contemporary art. Um, so yeah, anyway, tangent. Um, yeah, we have the neoclassic style, we obvious ties to antiquity, um, 
even in this artwork, uh, it was argued in the source that I read was an essay by Trudy Massent that, um, from Oxford, that this scene, while it's not a direct, uh, direct inspired artwork of the story, it really in subject matter and in like the allegory, the story, the moral that it serves really is in alignment with Iphigenia, um, which was the daughter of Agamemnon sacrificed the head of the Trojan War. Um, I think there's a lot of connection to this antiquity. Um, perhaps I, I like the argument. I, I could see I could see that sacrificed um, innocent woman in conjunction with that. Um, the example of gratuitous and revolutionary ideals and using the political propaganda evoking that emotion from the viewer so they really really understand and walk away with a deeper thought and maybe a deeper sol solidification of where they stand in all of this you know um so yeah that was my take and i really found a lot of this just so interesting and i'm excited to dive more into the art of this time period wow the context is just so rich and really really um infused throughout the the works and that's it's just such an interesting thing to see so anyway um that's all these are my sources i will have them uploaded on canvas there you go